Did you know that the very first digital watch was born out of a Stanley Kubrick film? In 1968, MGM released Kubrick's landmark sci-fi cult classic 2001 A Space Odyssey. Naturally, the production design department needed just the right futuristic touches, which led them to commission the Hamilton Watch Company to build a few props for the sets. Hamilton, in the midst of a landmark move to Europe, aided by the Electrodata Corporation out of Pasadena, California, created a digital clock and a number of analog wristwatches for the film. The clock didn't make it past post-production, but John Berge, Hamilton's then president of the digital watch division, had a larger, well, technically smaller idea for the clock, turning it instead into a fully digital consumer wristwatch. And in the years leading up to 1972, after the film's release, that's exactly what they carried through, crowning Hamilton the makers of the very first fully digital watch, the Hamilton Pulsar. Inspired by the scores of great digital watches and technological advancements since, we've rounded up our own favorite digital watches as a means by which to survey the current digital watch landscape. As always, we've organized our guide by price, so if you're looking for something budget friendly, the first few picks are going to be where you should start. Without anything further, let's dive right in with our first cult classic pick from Casio, with the AE1200WH-1A, or for short, the Casio World Time. Hamilton wasn't the only watchmaker funding the innovation of digital quartz-powered watches in the decades following World War II. Japanese watchmakers like Casio, who are now arguably the leaders of the digital watch market, also began releasing their own fully digital creations, the first of which was dubbed the Casiotron in 1974. Production of the Casiotron did eventually stop with Casio's continued innovation. In 2012, though, Casio released one hell of a watch originally designed for their youth collection that is still considered one of the best digital watches ever made, the AE1200WHD, nicknamed the Casio World Time or Casio World Timer. Like most Casios, the 39.5mm World Time absolutely packs in features with a dial display full of mini digital screens for each major function punctuated by black framing. The case itself is rugged, squared off, and molded from a black resin. Casio's popular and highly utilized material in their quartz-powered lineup. And you'll also quickly notice that this quartz-powered digital watch features a 10-year battery life rating for decades-long maintenance-free operation. Dimensionally, it sports a 39.5mm diameter case with a 12.5mm thickness and a water resistance rating of 100 meters or about 330 feet. Apart from the dial, which we'll get into in just a moment, the four highly polished silver tone pushers definitely give the World Time a retro-futuristic appearance. Starting on the right side, the World Time sports two pushers, one roughly at the 2 o'clock position for a backlight, and one just below at the 4 o'clock position that reads as search and controls access to any secondary time zones. On the left hand side, two other symmetrically laid out pushers at the 10 and 7 for switching through various modes to adjust the settings as necessary. Now we've established that the World Time isn't necessarily a chronograph despite its timing capabilities, but as the name suggests, the watch could certainly be a digital equivalent of a GMT as it does provide the ability to quickly cycle through 31 time zones mirrored on a quirky digital world map across 48 cities. The map's unique charm only further adds to all the love this watch gets, and it's really a defining visual feature of the world time. Just below, you have the largest section of the digital display that shows the day, date, and time, and just north, in the upper left-hand corner, a digital dial layout for timing framed by a traditional 60-minute track with small white applied numerals every 5 minutes and tiny indices for each minute in between. On the wrist, the stealthy world time wears true to size and fits comfortably with the 21mm ribbed resin band secured with a standard Casio branded buckle closure. And if you've been looking for a digital watch well under $100 packed with charm that will last a virtual lifetime with very little maintenance, the World Time is undeniably your best bet. Casio dominates the digital sector, so it would be a serious crime to include just one model in this guide. So instead, we're going to include some of their heaviest hitters to showcase just how much value they offer for the money. The Casio F91W-1 is one such watch that has a massive cult following, and for just over $20, you can pick one up for yourself. It's definitely considered a just get this watch for anyone that has under $50 or even under $20 to spend. Wants something they can beat up and not have to worry about, and packs in just as many features, if not more, than watches 10 or 20 times the price. The current F91W-1 is the modern production of the 1989 release. In other words, it's been so popular Casio has continued its production since its release, making it a staple in the budget watch world, digital interface aside. Since its release, it's gained an extensive use history. We'll leave it up to you to do some digging in that arena, but you may be surprised just how many notable figures, for better or for worse, have worn the watch and for various reasons. 
The 35.2mm diameter, the 38.2mm lug to lug, and the 8.5mm thickness lend itself to pretty much every wrist it's strapped around. Our wearer here has a wrist size just under 8 inches, but as you can see, it wears fine despite the modest case size. The full resin build is reminiscent of Casio's subsidiary G-Shock, who debuted the now infamous rectangular shaped resin 5000C just a few years prior in 1983. There's no doubt Casio wanted something like this within their own branded catalog, so really, you can almost think of this as a stripped down G-Shock DW5000C. Heavily water resistant, fully digital, resin constructed, inexpensive, and comes with a lengthy, virtually maintenance free 7 year battery life. The F91W-1 can be, and often has been, a lot of young watch enthusiasts gateway drug into the larger horological world, packing in plenty of features for a retail price just over $20, enough to get you hooked, like a stopwatch, hourly alarms, an automatic calendar, 12 or 24 hour time formats, a built in LED, which has an output one can only describe as ok as best, but this only adds to the budget charm of the watch in our opinion. All these features are powered by way of a quartz movement, and you can expect about plus to minus 30 seconds of deviation per month. The F91W series comes in a handful of different main case colors, OD green, blue, gold, silver, stainless steel, so if you want something that looks just a bit different than the all black DW5600, there are a few solid options. As a last note, although Casio themselves have the F91W currently listed at a $23 price point, look toward Casio's Amazon storefront if you're wanting to stay sub $20, as there are often sales that sync the MSRP by a Lincoln or two. The Timex T80 is another classic reissue that revives a design from 1974 with a number of modern integrations. This 70s release was Timex's first watch with an LCD or liquid crystal display, and is the basis for the modern T80 framework. Timex, Casio, Seiko, and their contemporaries developed these very first digital watches, or in other words frameworks for the modern reissues, all around the same time, and they riffed off each other, and that's R-I-F-F-E-D, in the process, so you'll often find that Timex has models that look very much like Casio, and vice versa, you're not seeing double. Take for example the Casio F91W-1 up against the T80, striking visual similarities. The T80, quite similar to the Casio F91W, uses a small 34mm square case shape with rounded corners that taper off into its integrated style lugs and stainless bracelet. The majority of the main case uses a high or mirror polish that wraps all the way around until it joins the horizontally brushed case back held on with these corner screws. Water resistant to only 30 meters, keep in mind that despite its beater price tag, take it off before the shower. At the 2, 4, 8, and 10 are pushers, or more accurately for digital watches, buttons, that control the T80's features. As the dial lays out, 2 and 4 control timing and resets, 8 cycles through the modes, and 10 controls the alarm, and is used to also confirm a change in base time. The T80 features Timex's standard Indiglow, another 80s invention that allows the entire digital screen to glow a blue-green for a few seconds before fading away. The T80 comes with a few different bracelet and strap options. Our favorite is the elastic stainless steel that fits the wrist without any major adjustments. But there's also a stainless unit without the stretch composition, and a few resin options as well. Okay, so now you may be thinking, well, if Casio and Timex have a handful of very similar budget-oriented digital watches, which one is right for me? Something like the Timex T80 or the Casio F91W. I mean, just take a look at them side by side. If you like this timeless design, you're going to be safe with either, but in terms of other metrics, here's our two cents. The Timex T80 is about three times the price of the F91W, but does it offer three times the value? Well, you'll have to decide for yourself, but you do get stainless steel, you also get a better bracelet design, a bit more heft and perceived value on the wrist in turn, and you also get Timex's superior Indiglo technology over the F91W's side light. Just take a look. We're sure you're familiar with Casio, you know Timex and Seiko and Hamilton, but do you know Armatron? Established in 1975 in the USA, smack dab in the midst of the revolutionary quartz crisis, Armatron's LCD watches rivaled the costlier options from the likes of Hamilton and its Swiss contemporaries, all while staying accessible to the budget-oriented consumer. The Armatron Griffey is still, in our opinion, a Pulsar, or excuse us, a PSR competitor, and while you can expect to pay upwards of $900 for Hamilton's LED reissue, the Griffey currently retails right around $70 USD, with a similar all blacked out full metal build and a bright red digital display. Let's take a closer look. 
Although Armatron's watches are still designed in the US, a lot of its manufacturing has shifted overseas to facilities in China, and we assume has been a means by which the company can stay afloat and compete with larger watchmakers. That being said, tons of micro brands manufacture their watches in offshore factories, so let's not dive into that right now. Let's instead take a look at what the unique digital watch offers in value. The current Griffey is a pretty faithful reissue to the 70s original, and lets the large bright red digital display do all the talking, as it did decades ago. The LCD has been swapped to an LED, and the numerals are quite a bit larger, almost as if they've been ripped from a 90s era General Electric alarm clock. On the wrist, the Griffey's barrel shaped case is 34mm in diameter at its widest and only 37mm lug to lug, with an even 9mm thickness. Like the Hamilton PSR, which we'll get to later in this guide, it wears just a touch larger than its dimensions would suggest, and that's in large part due to the pseudo-integrated design of the bracelet, giving the appearance that the vertical dimension does extend around the wrist longer than it actually does. At the 3 and the 4 are two buttons. The 3 o'clock button activates the LED's hour and minute status, which glows a bright red for 4-5 to five seconds before shutting off. Pressing this button again when the time is active will activate a calendar mode, and pressing this button a third time will allow you to access a running seconds counter, again only staying illuminated for 4-5 to five seconds before falling back to sleep. The 4 o'clock button simply aids with setting and resetting the time and date. The Griffey comes in 8 different variations, 4 different case finishes, and 4 different LED colorways. The most classic is this black and red or stainless and red combination, and our third pick would probably have to go to the gold and red combo for something a little more fashion forward. There are a few aspects of the watch where the budget friendly $70 price point starts to make some sense, and although they're not deal breakers, they're worth noting. We're not huge fans of the bracelet, it feels a little flimsy and the clasp mechanism doesn't quite feel all that secure. No better than options from Casio at half the price. Nonetheless, the Armatron Griffey is a great bit of quirky digital watch history that's still readily available from the same manufacturer all these years later with very little changes. Also, be sure to check out the Rogue, a 35mm unit that could easily compete against Casio's A1000 line or the Timex T80 and hold its own pretty well. It's not always the case that the most iconic watch in a watchmaker's catalog is also the most budget friendly or at the very least accessible. That being said, Casio's G-Shock line since 1983 has been one of the most iconic under Casio's umbrella, and the majority of their references are under $200. Since its inception in 1983, the first G-Shock, dubbed the DW5000C, cemented the archetypal rugged rectangular shape, a shape that's been a mainstay in one of the most identifiable silhouettes of a G-Shock ever since. Since Kikua eBay designed the first G-Shock, the groundbreaking Casio Venture rolled out iteration after iteration, and presently, one of our favorite references in the squared off form is the GWM5610-1 that takes the DW5600 and elevates it with a few additional features one of the most handy of which is a tough solar movement. Essentially, if you're at all familiar with the DW5600s, the GWM5610-1's external appearance will be quite familiar. The squared off resin case and bezel that provides 200 meters of water resistance, the four silver buttons for control built into the side of the case, the packed digital dial, goes on and on. They're kind of difficult to tell apart, and you really have to look at the digital dial and movement inside the case to uncover the majority of the changes. Top among them, as we said, is the tough solar movement, essentially G-Shock's version of what Citizen dubs the Eco Drive, a movement that can harness the power of the sun and weaker man-made fluorescent, LED, or other emission sources to provide the power. It also adds radio control time, which is another piece of nifty tech that automatically synchronizes to a time code transmitted by a radio transmitter connected to a time standard such as an atomic clock. The rest of the features are your standard inclusions that have been built into G-Shocks for decades. World time, stopwatch, timer, calendar, LED backlight, and in the lower right hand corner of the display, a battery reserve indicator. But you shouldn't have to ever worry about it, since once it's charged up, the battery can last up to 22 months without ever seeing the light, depending on the amount of use. On the wrist, expect the squared off G-Shocks like the GWM5610-1, like ours here, or the older DW5600 to wear slightly smaller than the dimensions would have you believe on paper. This particular version measures up at 46.7 lug to lug, 43.2 in diameter, and 12.7 millimeters thick. The all black colorway, and this usually goes for most watches, helps the case stay nice and tidy even a little smaller to the eye than something with a full stainless steel or bare metal finish. All in all, if you're looking for a just get this digital watch pick, you really cannot go wrong with a G-Shock, and you'll have a very, very difficult time finding an opposing opinion from anyone in the watch world, expert or armchair expert. 
Next up, we have a digital watch that consciously rejected smartwatch features to stay true to its original pre-smartwatch digital roots. This year, Timex teamed up with Huckberry to bring back the Ironman Triathlon, and if you lead an adventurous or otherwise active lifestyle and don't necessarily need all the smart tech packed into a G-Shock or a smartwatch and simply want a digital watch that feels more analog, even if it's not by definition, look no further. Let's take a closer look. We love the purest language Timex uses to describe the approach to reissuing this watch. They say that Flix takes us back to a simpler time, when watches were built for function and durability, rather than trying to be all things to all people. We love that because it's such a fresh and interesting approach for a watch that isn't mechanical in the slightest. Almost seems like an oxymoron to use mechanical-like language to describe a fully digital watch, but strangely, it fits, and here's why. Essentially, what they mean is that unlike what G-Shock has been rolling out lately with the move line, Timex has run in the opposite direction with this release in particular. It's functional, but specific, and doesn't build in a GPS or altimeter, there's no Bluetooth integration or smartphone companion application, no heart rate or blood oxygen monitor, really only time. This watch has a use history with athletes, pilots, military, and first responders, among others. And in 1986, Timex secured the rights from the Ironman Group to officially dub its 84 triathlon watch, developed in collaboration with the Ironman Group, the Ironman Triathlon. So the Ironman reference is pretty straightforward, but what about the Flix reference? Well, check it out. First, you're going to press and hold the 10 o'clock Indiglo button for about 3 seconds until you hear a beep. Now, the watch is in night mode, and it allows for hands-free Indiglo illumination with a Flix or flick of the wrist. Check it out. The glow stays active for about 4-5 to five seconds before fading again, but with plenty of motion as you would during physical activity anytime you bring the watch up to your wrist, the Indiglow will certainly be active. The stripped back, time only focus of the digital watch combined with durability is essentially why the Iron Man Flix reissue is said to be a popular one, just as it was in decades past. The 44mm resin case provides 100 meters of water resistance, builds in 6 tangible buttons on the side of the case and below the digital screen, and only packs in 12 or 24 hour time, a chronograph function, a countdown timer, a date display, and a memo pad for logging your activities. Even though we think it's pretty clear why the Timex Huckberry Iron Man Flix reissue is a digital winner in our eyes, let's put it another way. Former Navy SEAL and well-known motivational speaker Jocko Willink almost exclusively wears a Timex Iron Man. Will the Jocko nickname catch on? We can't say. But you can't deny it speaks volumes about the watch's function if it has the full backing of one of the world's most well-known warriors. Our next two digital watch picks are, yet again, reissues. Are you seeing a pattern? And are really just love letters to the 70s digital boom, and not necessarily the watchmaker's most well-known references. They're fun digital pieces of history, and will no doubt strike up some fun conversation when they're worn. The Yema LED is the first of two very similar looking watches we're going to talk about, the other being from Belova with the Compuchon. Yema was born in 1948 in France, and quickly became one of the most prolific exporters of watches in the 60s. When the quartz crisis hit shortly thereafter, Yema hopped on the bandwagon and put out an LED watch. Despite the turbulence in European watchmaking during this time, Yema survived, and with it the LED. Just a few years ago, the LED was reissued true to form with some minor modern technological alterations. But the charm remains, and it serves as a very stylish, very solid option for those who dig the retro-futuristic aesthetic or want a digital watch with a very simple configuration, but one that really isn't boring to the eye. Anyway, as style-heavy as it is, the LED actually builds in some serious utility. Take for example the 100 meters of water assistance. That's a considerable amount more than some of our other more costly picks that we'll get to shortly. The highly angular 316L stainless steel main case is a highly wearable 37.5mm in diameter, 42.5mm lug to lug, and just about 10.5mm thick. With the way the bracelet integrates with the case, we'd say it wears a touch over that, perhaps more so with 38 or 38.5, and the bright silver finish definitely doesn't hide and no doubt influences how it wears. At the 3 is your main operational button that awakens the LED display which stays in a sleep mode to conserve the battery when the watch is not intended for use. A single press wakes the red display from the time in a 12 hour or 24 hour format, another press will reveal the date in a day, month, year format, and a third press reveals a rolling seconds, and the button just below at the 4 is used for setting the features. 
What you have on the front is a very simple presentation with a band of dark red mineral crystal that extends from the edges of the case, protecting the smaller inset quartz powered LED display. Yema says is proprietary. The Yema LED comes in two finishes, gold and silver, the former also using a red screen. We love the single link bracelet that almost gives it an integrated feel on the wrist, even though it doesn't quite meet the case and lugs in the same way as an actual integrated unit. It nonetheless bakes an even more retro charm and feels nice and comfortable on the wrist. Actually, we'll go even further because at $300 even, the LED has one of the most ruggedly well-built bracelets we've come across in a very long time. The 1970s was a huge decade for the advancement of LEDs. Well, in terms of watchmaking, at least. The actual tech was a product of the 60s, but it took folks a little while to wrap their minds around ways to practically integrate the new light-emitting diode tech into consumer products at a reasonable price. Like the Hamilton Pulsar, which again we're going to get to in just a few minutes with the PSR, the Belova Computron was a brilliant 70s retro-futuristic creation in no less brilliant full-chrome form. Production eventually waned, and only in 2019 did Belova bring back the Computron within their archival series beefed up with some internal upgrades, all while keeping the full chrome silhouette almost entirely as it once was at a price point well under $500. While the trapezoidal 31mm main case and the slanted mineral crystal are extremely eye-catching, the actual functionality of the Computron is, well, fairly rudimentary. Press the button on the right side of the case to activate the LED to read the time, and with repeated presses, you're able to access a date and a dual time zone. Currently, the Computron ships in three standard editions, a gold, a silver, and a matte black. And to put it plainly, the first two are going to get you a ton of attention. They both employ an extensive amount of high polish around the main case and into the bracelet whose central link continues the ribbing pattern on the top face of the case. While the modern reissues do use a ton of high polish, the 1970s version actually used some brushing, at least for the sides of the case. And seeing that the case shape is already so aggressive, we do wish Belova continued the horizontal brushing of the original to perhaps tone it down just a touch. That being said, if you're looking at the Computron to begin with as a fan of retrofuturism, flying under the radar probably isn't something on your radar to begin with anyways. We can talk about the Computron and the Yema LED in the same way as we spoke about the Timex T80 and the Casio F91W. Both offer very similar silhouettes, but in our opinion, long story short, the Yema LED's bracelet and overall build quality in hand feel far superior than the more expensive Computron, and you'll save about $100 as well. The watch landscape has become increasingly competitive as manufacturing capabilities have become more democratic. There are now hundreds, if not thousands, of independent watch operations who have tried, with varying degrees of success, to launch their own creations. One of these success stories is Autodromo, whose pioneer, Bradley Price, combined his industrial design background with his passion for the automotive industry to create some of the most unique and attainable car-inspired watches available today. For the Autodromo Group C, Price evoked the slab-sided, aerodynamic forms of 80s legends like the Sauber C9 and the Porsche 962 as the framework for the Group C's look and feel. You can clearly see how the watch's case looks like a hood, the way the case shape begins to slant downward and taper and round inward at the corners, plus the obvious nod to the Group C racing category, a category of sports car racing introduced by the International Automobile Federation in 1982. The Group C comes in a handful of different colors and case finishes. We have one here in bare stainless steel and full brushing on the top side of the case with the yellow accents around the dial and the bright yellow buttons at the 2, 4, 8, and 10. Speaking of, operation controlled by said buttons is extremely simple. As the back side of the case lays out, as well as a fun illustration in the product manual, the 2 o'clock controls the light feature, which is a simple EL backlight, the 4 o'clock is a split or reset button, the 8 o'clock is your mode button, and the 10 o'clock is your start stop. One thing to note with digital watches is that most likely, like the Group C, the watch will build in quite a few buttons for control, and that means more points for water ingress. A lot of watchmakers do a really great job of building in considerable amounts of water resistance, despite all these potential points of incursion. But that doesn't mean they all maintain the same build protection, like something from G-Shock, for example. As such, keep in mind that the Group C does only build in 30 meters of water resistance, so nothing more than a quick clean with a damp cloth and don't make the mistake of keeping it on for a shower. Under a sapphire crystal, which is notably premium for a watch with this look and feel, the right aligned LCD module displays the time with a running seconds and a day date just above, a timer and a chronograph split time mode, and an alarm feature. Super simple to operate and ridiculously straightforward, 
which can certainly be a plus with all the feature-laden digital watches that can get quite confusing to operate. In other words, the simple approach here is a breath of fresh air when Autodromo could have easily packed in double the features unnecessarily. On the wrist, secured with a 20mm FKM rubber strap, the Group C sizes up at 36mm in diameter with a stout 42mm lug-to-lug -lug with a slim 10mm thickness. All in all, it seems to wear just a touch over 36mm, and that we think has to do with how the lugs transition seamlessly into the rubber strap, which makes the lug-to-lug -lug feel and look a bit longer than 42mm would suggest. The Group C is currently offered in a half dozen colorways, like we said. If you're looking for something that makes a splash, we'd suggest the bright yellow DLC version that washes the whole main case in the same color as our buttons here on the raw stainless version. Or if you're looking for something stealthy, there are two black DLC versions, one with yellow and red buttons and the other with neon green units. Keeping in the vein of retro futurism, as we pretty much have been for the large majority of this guide, next up is a space age cult classic reissue from Hamilton, the Hamilton PSR. The PSR is molded after the Hamilton Pulsar, the world's first digital watch with an LED backlight, which was recently reissued as the Hamilton PSR, in a form factor almost exactly like the 1970s original, as we laid out in our introduction. Seiko eventually bought the Pulsar name from Hamilton, and truth be told, the Pulsar did have a very short life anyway. With all the recent reissues, however, Hamilton decided to take another look at the digital statement watch and had made a few internal changes while keeping the styling as it was when legends like Keith Richards, Jack Nicholson, and Elton John, to name a few, proudly wore the Pulsar as pop culture tastemakers. So what's so different about the PSR over the Pulsar? Well, the name, for starters. Like we said, Seiko bought and then applied the name to a series of largely inconsequential watches, so Hamilton landed on a more or less abbreviated form of the word, and that we guess was still up for grabs, PSR. Don't hold it against us, we're not copyright lawyers. If you're not familiar with the original Pulsar, let's walk you through the styling of the new PSR. It uses a very simple 40.8mm by 34.7mm stainless steel case, this one with a full black coating, with a pseudo end link that's meant to look the part but is just part of the main case, a 3 o'clock button to adjust the time and light up the LED, the screen itself with a box sapphire above, and Hamilton text in the lower right. Very, very few changes were made here to the externals, which is great. The only visible change here is the Hamilton text instead of the Pulsar text, for obvious reasons. We do wish that Hamilton instead used something like PSR in the lower right to stick to the ethos of the original, but the Hamilton sans serif typeface is pleasing and it fits the overall futuristic bill, so not really a huge complaint. Hamilton, however, did update the star of the show with improved tech. Instead of a rudimentary LED, the screen is now an LCD and OLED hybrid display. This is an important change, especially for a battery-powered watch. LEDs are pretty power hungry, and if you want your display to stay on without any sort of solar power gathering ability to constantly offset the consumption, battery life would certainly suffer. To solve this, Hamilton keeps the screen in a low power, darker mode via an LCD, and then the button activates a much brighter, more saturated OLED display that stays on for about 5-6 to six seconds before reverting back to the LCD. As such, the battery life rating is pretty solid at 5 years with normal use of the OLED. To adjust the time, you're going to simply press and hold the button, which will allow you to toggle through the numerals the same way as you would a bedside alarm clock. One of our favorite parts of the PSR, digital display and stealthy all black case aside, is the three link bracelet. I mean, just take a look at the rounded links and the slight taper toward the butterfly clasp. It's visibly unique, and the stellar execution of the case's finishing carries over just as well here. The only thing that would have made it near perfect would have been using screw pins with every link, not just the end link. So in our opinion, for someone looking for a true statement piece that isn't seen in the wild all that often, the Hamilton PSR is an excellent, fully digital choice. There is no arguing that Omega has solidified their reputation for creating timepieces that have well-equipped some of the world's most heralded explorers. I mean, no one can deny how much fame the Speedmaster brought Omega through their collaboration with NASA during the Apollo program. Our next and final digital watch pick is another space-oriented sleeper we think deserves a bit more attention in the Speedmaster line. The Skywalker X33, with a full titanium build and a singular digital analog hybrid display. First off, compared to some of our first picks, this is going to be a pretty sizable investment at $5,900. But Omega doesn't mess around, and just because it builds in a digital display doesn't make it any less Omega. The standard is still extremely high. Let's start with the build quality. First, each and every part from the main case, to the bezel housing, to the crown, to the bracelet and clasp, is grade 2 or grade 5 titanium, 
and Omega's used a rugged matte finish by way of fine brushing on each and every surface. Next, the bezel, which is definitely a standout feature, is a black ceramic unit inset within a titanium housing and comes with bi-directional rotation. It's matted but picks up plenty of light, so it renders more so as a gray over a deep black and matches the gray tones of the titanium very nicely. As the case back lays out, the Skywalker X-33 has been fully tested by the European Space Agency, or ESA for short. It's more or less a NASA equivalent to meet the extreme demands of space. The testing happens in the same facility that tests satellites and rockets before launch in the Netherlands. So we're talking vibration tests, temperature tests, rotational tests to simulate a higher degree of gravity than we experience here on Earth, and more. There are only a select few Omega Speedmaster references with this pedigree, so this is special. That being said, the Skywalker X-33, unfortunately, does only come with 30 meters of water resistance, so keep this top of mind that despite its professionally vetted durability, there are still some ways the watch can get ruined. And while it won't be from seven times the Earth's gravity, a simple shower could potentially do it in. Kind of ironic. All right, now on to technical details. The Skywalker X-33 is 45 millimeters on the wrist with a 48.5 millimeter lug to lug and a beefy 14.7 millimeter thickness. And it looks to wear its size pretty accurately. By way of the titanium case and bracelet, it's also incredibly light for its size. On the scale, we measured four ounces even. For example, the 42 millimeter Omega Speedmaster, the Moonwatch, on their stainless steel bracelet weighs 134 grams or roughly 4.7 ounces. So despite it being overall larger by 3 millimeters, it's lighter. Onto the dial. Under a scratch resistant sapphire and by way of the Omega Caliber 5619, the analog hands and LCD window displays three different time zones, a chronograph, a timer, an MET or emission elapsed time feature, a PET or phase elapsed time feature, three alarms, and a perpetual calendar. To cycle through all these modes, you press the crown in to change and adjust the digital display. The 5619 is also a highly accurate quartz movement and expect to swap the battery every two years with normal amounts of use. We absolutely love the tangible feel of the buttons when they're pressed. Although you can't hear them, you can feel a tangible click as you would a standard pusher on a chronograph, and it gives the digital watch a very sturdy and premium feel, almost mechanical in nature. We also love how well the digital background is integrated. In other words, with less costly digital watches, you can see how the screen kind of sits within the case, the edges and all. Here the elements just appear and almost don't seem like they're part of a screen at all, more so a punch out if that makes sense. We also love the layering of the dial with the inset loom markers within the sloping chapter ring and the bright red accent of the seconds hand. As we mentioned, the Skywalker X-33 uses a 20mm titanium bracelet with a simple double button push clasp and it builds in a few micro adjustments for fine tuning the fit. Apart from the full titanium build, nothing specifically stands out here as being notable. 